East Asia Strategy Forum for the second session of this two-day conference. My name is Arta Moini, and I am the Director of Research here at IPD, a North American think tank dedicated to advancing prudent realism and military restraint in foreign policy. U.S.-China relations have aptly been called the most critical bilateral relationship of the 21st century. And this panel titled Sino-American Competition and the Emerging Asia-Pacific Order focuses especially on examining this dynamic and evolving nature of this relationship. There is no denying that competition looms large over this relationship. And we hope here to shed light as much as possible on the domestic and international drivers of it, as well as to discuss what kind of a contest it is and its scope. Does the competition involve real and vital security interests? Or is it more geoeconomic or a technological tussle? And what are the institutional, ideological, and perhaps even cultural and philosophical reasons behind the more antagonistic framing of the rivalry among many in the establishment who invoke the language of a new Cold War? We at IPD have been concerned with these issues for some time. In fact, we have devoted ourselves to producing a genealogical account of the contest and its origins and catalysts. We recently concluded a five month running series on the current landscape of Sino-American relations, which convened an, inter an interdisciplinary group of scholars and practitioners from IR theorists and political theorists to diplomats, historians, and military strategists in a series of panels and discussions, which are available for viewing on IPD's YouTube and Rumble channels. Among this group actually uh, is Michael Swain, or was Michael Swain, uh, who we are happy is also a panelist for today's session. The fruit of these efforts have come in terms of a white paper, fresh off the print, of which we are immensely proud, called On the Brink, Averting a New Cold War Between Washington and Beijing, prepared by the research team under my lead. The report identifies securitization, threat inflation, and absolutist conceptions of exceptionalism as real dangers to both US and China, as well as regional stability in Asia. You can find a link to this report below uh, or in the chat box, and I urge you all to read it and let us know your feedback. And now for the event that we're all waiting for. Let me introduce our amazing moderator, Dr. Van Jackson. Van is a political scientist who specializes in Asian security and the politics of US foreign policy. He is a senior lecturer of international relations at the Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. He is also a distinguished fellow with the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. He's the author of dozens of articles and policy papers, as well as two books on US North Korean relations. He's an editor of um, War on the Rocks and a regular contributor to uh, Doc of Minerva. His forthcoming third book is Pacific Power Paradox, American Statecraft and the Fate of Asian Peace uh, with Yale University Press. Last by, but by no means least, Van is the host of the Undiplomatic Podcast. We are delighted to have him with us today. Van, thank you for being here. I let you uh, go ahead and introduce the panelists. Yeah, thanks. Uh, welcome again to everybody on this panel. Again, we're talking about US-China competition in the emerging Asia Pacific order. And there's a, there's a whole thing I could read here, but I think you get the, the gist of what this panel is about when we talk about Sino-US competition in Asia, right, the primary theater of competition. Um, so we have four speakers today, all of whom are distinguished in one way or another. They've also all published recently on the very topic we're here to discuss today. Um, and they all have longer, again, distinguished bios. I'm not gonna read them out, but uh, I'll introduce them all now. Uh, first, we've got Ralph Casa, uh, President Emeritus and WSD Honda Chair with Pacific Forum. We've got Michael Swain, Director, East Asia Program at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. And we've got Bob Ross, Robert Ross, a Professor at Boston College and an Associate at the Harvard Fairbank Center. And uh, Michael Vlahos, senior fellow at the Institute here, also a professor at Johns Hopkins University. So uh, the way we'll do this is I'll, I'll pose an opening primer question to each of our panelists. They'll have a few minutes to respond and then we'll enter into sort of more of a discussion. Like Zoom doesn't really lend itself to free willing debate, but you know we'll try our best. And then after about an hour, give or take, we'll have the panel address questions 
from the audience. So you can, if you want, you can submit those questions in the chat at any time and um, we can pull them that way. Or, you know, you can use the raise hand function in Zoom when the time comes, I guess. Um, chat might be easier. Okay, so housekeeping out of the way, onto the show. To start out with uh, Ralph, big opening question. How do you see the Biden administration's overall approach to China in relation to previous administrations, like changes versus continuities? You know, what are they? How significant are they? It helps if I unmute first. Thank you, Van. Uh, good question. Uh, I, I would start off by saying I think there's been a great continuity in U.S. policy toward China. Uh, the difference with the Biden administration is much more a difference in style than in substance. Uh, you recall uh, President Trump was once asked, uh, how is it that one day you're calling Xi Jinping your best friend and the next day you're calling him a crook? And Trump's answer was, it's my negotiating style and it works for me. Uh, we can debate how well it worked, uh, but clearly uh, this is not Joe Biden's negotiating style. I think we saw that on evidence yesterday with the, uh, with the summit uh, with him, him and Xi. Uh, still direct, uh, still not papering over differences, uh, but certainly uh, more of the, quote, traditional diplomacy than we've seen in the last four years. Uh, but historically, uh, US, China, uh, U.S. policy toward China has always been uh, a mix of what I call the three C's, uh, cooperation, uh, competition, and confrontation. Uh, during uh, the Obama administration, uh, Obama's outstretched hand policy that he began with, uh, the emphasis was clearly on cooperation. Uh, I've written that it was the right policy, but for the wrong China. Uh, if it, we were still in a China that was guided by Deng Xiaoping's hide your strength and bide your time, uh, a focus on cooperation would have been fine. Uh, unfortunately, that China is long gone, as are almost all of Deng Xiaoping's dictums. Uh, and we can discuss those obviously during the Q&A session or in, in further uh, comments. Uh, but uh, when Trump uh, administration came in, uh, the US had already shifted from a focus on cooperation to more of a focus on, on competition. Uh, the national security strategy under, under President Trump uh, clearly laid out uh, China as a revisionist power, as, as a country that was following policies that uh, were against U.S. interest in Asia and, and globally. Uh, that, that has continued. Uh, the, the buzzword today now, I guess, is cooperate, where we can, uh, compete where we should, and confront where we must. Uh, but it's always been a combination of those three Cs. Uh, the reason why the focus lately has been more on the competition and on the confrontation is, in my view, not because of U.S. desires, but because of Chinese behavior. Uh, and as China has become more aggressive, as as the wolf warrior diplomats have replaced the bide your time and hide your strength uh, philosophy, uh, as it's become China is a big country and you're not in speaking to its neighbors, uh, there was a call for the US uh, to speak up and Obama started doing that with the pivot. It was certainly clear during the Trump administration and I think it's continuing here now. Uh, the main difference, uh, if you go back and read the national security strategy during the Trump administration, it also talked about how the foundation for U.S.-Asia policy was rested on our alliances. And then the president would come out with his negotiating style and start badmouthing the allies and sort of making them un unsecure about the U.S. commitment. Uh, that has changed. We now have a president who actually his comments are consistent with the national security strategy, both the interim guidance and I'm sure the, the full strategy, which will be out here, I, I imagine, in a couple of months. Uh, and now we'll, we'll go forward. But again, uh, the defining point is that it's been Chinese behavior, Chinese actions that have compelled the U.S. to focus more on the competition and confrontation uh, and less on the cooperation. Whether that'll change now after the uh, Xi-Biden summit uh, is for us to see. Thanks.
I was on mute myself. Okay, yeah, thank you. The three C's, I hadn't heard that specific formulation, but it, uh, it actually makes sense. So if I could turn to Michael Swain, you know, I wanted to ask about strategic culture and threat perception or, you know, threat inflation as the case might be. Do you think that uh, China or the U.S. has an outsized threat perception of the other or do you think they see each other more or less clearly and there's just large conflicts of interest? Like, how do you suss that out? Well, great. Thank you very much, fans. Pleasure to be here at the forum and be participating again. Um, I guess my view on this is that if you step back and look more broadly at the United States and China, I think both countries tend to inflate threats and they tend to worst case the motives of others. They tend to cherry pick evidence to support those inflated threats and they can hence easily overreact to what they see as perceived challenges. And they both tend to do a considerable amount of mirror imaging in trying to assess the motives of the other. Now, all of this, I think, makes for a somewhat dangerous situation um, when there's a power transition underway, as there is now in Asia, and a clear potential catalysts for confrontation, such as over an issue like Taiwan. But uh, more broadly, when you think of strategic culture, analysts such as uh, David Campbell and Richard Hofstadter have looked across US history and political ideology, and they see clear attitudes and beliefs driving threat inflation and overreaction in American political thinking. Hofstadter years ago wrote in a very seminal article of a paranoid style in American politics. It's characterized by a sense of heated exaggeration, suspiciousness, and indeed conspiratorial fantasy. Um, Campbell, for his part, in a very thorough study of uh, US political ideology and, and, and the history has described what he calls discourses of danger in American foreign policy that really go back all the way to the founding of the Republic and, won't, and which don't necessarily require an actual discernible threat to emerge and to grow. Now, these kinds of views have really identified this trait as being motivated by cultural, moral, political factors, but usually involving efforts to try to define more clearly uh, the uniquely democratic and freedom-oriented nature of the American experiment, if you will, in order to provide unity and coherence for a country that is built on abstract ideals and values, as opposed to racial or ethnic or geographic criteria per se. And also emphasizing this kind of thing to build support for the central government among a people who really have a suspicion, actually, of excessive state power. So as a result, U.S. leaders have really tended to generally view America as a uniquely influential force in the world and a force for good that justifies an off-stated U.S. claim to what you call leadership of the free world. And of course, uh, supplementing this view, a lot of Americans and American leaders believe that a central purpose of U.S. leadership is not just to um, support existing democratic nations, but also to increase their number globally. Uh, this is seen as necessary for a whole host of reasons, moral and political, uh, etc. So this inclines the U.S. to be very suspicious, if not antagonistic, towards non-democratic countries. And the PRC right now is the biggest non-democratic country that is challenging the US. Um, so I see all those tendencies at work today in the United States and they're reinforced by a certain insecurity and uncertainty that many Americans have about America and about the future of the United States. And many of them look for simple narratives to describe America's or explain America's problems as Trump did. Uh, now for the Chinese, and I'll be brief, um, I think the Chinese really don't do much better as a threat inflator. As we know, the PRC is a one-party dictatorship with a communist and a post-colonialist, if you will, nationalist ideology that looks at Western liberal democratic capitalist states and the U.S. in particular is potentially hostile uh, towards them. And this, of course, was augmented and has been augmented among the Chinese uh, after the Second World War by their view that the United States has achieved a position of hegemony, as they call it, that it will want to defend against all comers, especially a non-democratic country like China. So this leads a lot of Chinese to assume that the US really doesn't want China to develop and to be able to defend itself against potentially threatening US capabilities. So the US is constantly pressuring, undermining the PRC regime uh, 
and trying to prevent national reunification. So that stokes threat perception and threat inflation. Now, underlying all this, of course, is the idea that the Chinese themselves are peace loving, uh, that they have only ever looked for peace, that they're only defensive, and therefore this accentuates these kinds of threats to their peaceful orientation. Now that's a nonsense, of course, if you know Chinese history, but it does have an effect, I think, on how the Chinese look at their environment and, and how they see foreigners. So there's a lot of tendencies there for both of these countries to be deeply suspicious and to see dire threats when in fact, the threats may not be all that dire. But all that said, let me just end by saying, um, dispositions to threat inflation doesn't necessarily lead to policy conclusions that favor aggression over moderation uh, in every instance or in most instances. Despite this, their dispositions, I think both Beijing and Washington um, are also to a great extent pragmatic and not aggressively evangelical. They both recognize the constraints and opportunities for themselves resulting from heavy levels of economic, scientific, and technological interdependence between the US and China, the deterring power of nuclear weapons, and the very strong need to cooperate with each other to deal with massive common transnational threats like climate and pandemics. So neither nation has the kind of what I regard as ruthless sort of predatory or power maximizing instincts that offensive realist theories often propound for any country, any major country. So while levels of competition and rivalry in some areas, especially economics and technology, can be very deep, a true Cold War, in my opinion, uh, is avoidable between the US and China, barring some kind of gross miscalculations by either side, which, which we can talk about. And I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, thanks. I don't know if I should feel comforted or discomforted by all that, but <laughs> it is at minimum troubling that both great powers seem to suffer from a degree of paranoia um, and exceptionalism, incidentally. So um, if we could turn to Bob Ross, um, you know, what, what are China's priorities and expectations for managing its relationship with the U.S.? Like, it seems pretty clear that Xi Jinping has priorities other than the U.S., obviously, but it's not always clear to at least outsiders a, where the U.S. fits in China's ambitions, but also like, you know, what are the other things that occupy his mind? What does he expect from the U.S. at this time in particular? So thank you, Van, and uh, thanks for the opportunity with this group and this audience. So it's a good opportunity. Um, there are really two parts to your question there. Um, what is it the Chinese want? And how do they go about pursuing it? And where does the US fit into that? Um, we often call China a revisionist power. And I think that's true. We should acknowledge that. Um, after all, since the early 1950s, American bases in Korea, Japan, Philippines, Thailand, and then increasingly in later years, Singapore and Malaysia basically encircled Chinese waters and China's coastal waters with its American Air Force and the American Navy and that superiority was absolute. No country would feel secure in that environment. So for the Chinese, and this goes back to Deng Xiaoping and even Mao Zedong, the, one of the purposes of economic development, of industrialization, modernization, was we say, um, rich, nation, rich nation, strong army. And that strong army then became a strong navy because they wanted secure waters along their coast. A reasonable expectation for any country if you have the capabilities. And that meant basically weakening American alliances on China's periphery. And this has been China's objective in a more proactive way over the last five to 10 years. Now, the US is clearly the obstacle for that one because America likes its bases. We like the cornerstone of American post World War II security has been those bases whether it's in Korea, whether it's in Japan, whether it's in the Philippines. And so this in many respects is a quintessential great power zero sum relationship. To the extent that China is successful in having greater maritime security, the result is gonna be weaker American alliances, weaker American naval presence, weaker American security in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea, throughout East Asia. The so China's objectives should be clear and we shouldn't 
particularly see it as outside the norm of a great power or a rising great power. And we have to ask how China goes about doing this. How do we assess Chinese behavior? Now, there's a tendency in much of our discussion of China to, to see the impulses for Chinese behavior coming from inside China. Whether it's nationalism, the way China behaves, or China started doing this, or China started doing that. And if you're outside, say, Washington, you want to look at the politics of great power relations. What are the US-China politics? And so, and we also want to look at China in a comparative perspective of great power politics. So the first perspective would be that there's a tendency to say China's belligerent or China's aggressive. Well, these are inherently relative terms, somewhat along a continuum. And China's policy in many ways is very Theodore Roosevelt. One, we see an essence of gunboat diplomacy, but without necessarily the gunboats on presence. Whether it's Chinese fishing boats that are unarmed, or whether it's the Chinese Coast Guard, the constant presence of this larger neighbor in China, in the vicinity of American security partners, makes them worry. China's always there. Its Coast Guard's always there. Its Navy's always over the horizon. So that constant presence is China's strategy to make them worry. As one Filipino legislature put it, we know who the real naval power is. America comes in and goes home. China's always here. And the other aspect of Chinese behavior is the flip side is walk softly, but carry a big stick. So relatively speaking, we can, you know, despite the tendency to use more loaded terms, China has soft pedaled its behavior, particularly compared to the United States and American policy in oh, Syria or American policy in Libya or American policy out the Middle East. And China hasn't killed anyone since the end of the Sino-Vietnamese War, hasn't invaded any countries, hasn't done any air assaults. It's basically walking softly and carrying a big stick. So in many respects, if we think of belligerence or aggression as a relative concept, it's been fairly moderate. But that doesn't mean there isn't a significant US-China conflict of interest over vital security interests that America needs to worry about, that America needs to respond to in ways that can maximize or improve American security. And, but to characterize it in, say, negative, a difficult process. So how does China deal with the United States in that context? China is very clear. It wants cooperation with the United States. It wants a consensus. It wants stability. It wants harmony. Of course it does. It was very good for China under Deng Xiaoping when they kept their head down, bided their time, kept stability, and up China grows. The challenge for the United States is that America wants to push back against the rise of China. We're not happy with China achieving parity in the South China Sea. As Michael has written on occasions, America still wants dominance. It still wants to maintain its allies. And so we're the ones pushing back and challenging the, the stability in the region by being more overt against China, by, by starting a trade war, by having technology limitations, by changing the, the norms, if you will, the rules of US-Taiwan um, US relations. And so we have this interesting dichotomy where both countries are pursuing their interests in ways you would expect, nothing abnormal here. But the challenge for the United States is how you go about competing with China, as Ralph was suggesting, while simultaneously cooperating, and at times, perhaps confrontation. It's fair to say neither Trump nor Biden have done that well to date. Biden policy was pretty explicit. We will cooperate with China when it's in our interests. Well, what about Chinese interests? To expect unilateral Chinese or, or one way un, unreciprocated Chinese cooperation with American interests was asking a lot, and it didn't happen. Whether in Iran, where China and Russia are building up military cooperation, whether in North Korea, where the sanctions are ending with North Korea, um, whether it's the heightened tension in the Taiwan Strait, all of these are don't expect our cooperation. When you start a trade war, you start an ideological war, you call us a genocidal nation, you should expect us to have wolf warrior diplomacy in response. To the greatest wolf warriors in the last 10 years would have been Trump and Pompeo. Um, don't expect cooperation. So Ralph is right. What does this summit mean, this virtual summit? They talk more about cooperation, lowering the tone of the conflict. Can the United States and China find a way going forward that we can cooperate when it's our interest and quarantine the conflicts so they don't spill over? Thank you, Ben. Well, dude, you addressed everything, so we can go home. All right. Thanks. Okay. So um, if we could turn to the other Michael Vlahos.
you know, who is doing a better job here between China and the U.S. of like winning over Asia? Um, and then related to that question, do you think China and the U.S. are playing by the same rules of international relations or even playing by, like, are they playing the same game? Oh, man, <clears throat> I, I like the way you framed that question. Um, Americans have an extremely narrow, uh, limited understanding of narrative in the context of, of strategy, strategic behavior, even war. And in effect, um, it, in an age of religious nationalism, which is the age that we currently inhabit, um, the sacred narrative drives the event. In other words, events flow from the emotional standing and the existential commitment to realization that such national narratives demand. So uh, with this sort of view on history, if you were to look in the past, for example, um, the uh, French commitment to ecstatic realization in terms of uh, reunifying with Alsace and Lorraine after 1871, or the Italians and their Italia Irredenta uh, was uh, the force that drove them to a disastrous war in 1914. Um, the irredentist or revanchist claims are not simply to be understood as visions, but rather as the deep uh, rooted fulfillment of the very sort of vision that uh, allows for a sense of national kinship and national community. And the act of, of achieving this fulfillment, the, what I call ecstatic realization, is not required uh, necessarily by war, but can actually be achieved uh, ceremonially. And uh, this is in fact, I think what China is doing based on uh, uh, antecedents for such ceremonial strategies. The most successful, of course, being that pursued by Herr Hitler in the 1930s, uh, an almost unbroken series of triumphs without battle. And yet uh, it, it was able to completely overturn the uh, European balance and to realize in many ways uh, the dreams of Germany uh, for hundreds of years since the you know, collapse of the Holy Roman Empire. And so what you have uh, a, a, as uh, an antecedent uh, ha has been recently practiced uh, in the form of the seizure of Crimea, which was a purely ceremonial, highly ritualized, symbolic action that was wholly successful. So that is a, a near-term model, but these other uh, examples in history really speak to China. And we should never um, either underestimate or downplay the, uh, a, a, essential um, power and significance of the uh, Taiwanese uh, reabsorption or reunification as being the capstone of a, a long-standing, deeply embedded story in, in modern China. And that story is at the heart of the claim of the CCP to power, but also to the hearts of their citizens. And uh, as such, it must be done. Now, the question of course is, uh, the U.S., in contrast, has a, a wholly different narrative, a narrative that was fulfilled, again, ecstatically in World War II, uh, and uh, the emotional power of what the U.S. achieved in World War II was enough to uh, permit uh, a recreation and extension of that uh, experience for the next 70 years. And uh, the Cold War essentially was a... a uh, kind of incarnation of American uh, messianism and millenarianism extended from the war all the way into the present and future and being uh, re-evoked endlessly after 9-11. And the problem with this narrative is that it's gone bust. It's emptied out in the last 20 years. Moreover, the, the civil strife and domestic division within the US is at its highest point since the civil war. And as we all know, it was the domestic division, especially in France in the 1930s, the, the era of the popular front that immobilized the French completely and, and uh, helped to forestall any response on their part to the uh, Nazi ceremonial strategy. Uh, and it, it, 
the, the Chinese, in contrast, have had this strategy already ratified. And it's been ratified in the agreement over Hong Kong. Uh, and it's been ratified also by American acknowledgement of a unified China in, in theory and uh, symbolically, but also uh, an, an understanding that, that Taiwan is part of China. And now remember, this is not simply a, um, a capstone uh, for the century of, of humiliation. It's also by, by seizing Taiwan. Uh, the, the Communist Party is able to, um, to realize uh, a symbolic reunification of the two halves of the Chinese Revolution, the CCP and the KMT. So you have a double um, uh, power uh, waiting to be unleashed here that would, that would uh, reassert the bonds between the CCP and the Chinese people. So this is going to happen. The question is, how can it be done uh, without a war? War is not really possible, but uh, a ceremonial uh, approach to reabsorbing Taiwan is not only possible, it, it I believe is going to happen. And what the Chinese uh, need to do is to achieve strategic surprise and to have the kind of capability to in effect do a much larger and more demanding uh, operation than what Putin was able to do extremely quickly. And th th thus it requires a kind of uh, on-scene force majeure. It needs to be an attack brusque coming out of nowhere. And it has to be essentially a coup de main. Now uh, that can be achieved and the uh, Egyptian uh, preparation for the crossing of the Suez Canal shows exactly how a uh, strategic surprise could be achieve in such a, an attack. And the essence of the attack is to, um, is to achieve the goal and put the United States in a position where it's caught off guard and thus has to make the decision to attack China. And uh, that would be, I think, an impossible choice for any president. And um, this, I, I believe, sets up the, the framework. But they, as, as you said, Ben, there are two different conceptualizations. And the US approach to the entire um, amity and stability of the Western Pacific and Indian Ocean is based on a model, uh, a paradigm that no longer has any, any force. It, it, ha it has some uh, residual, some legacy claims, obviously NATO is still with us, et cetera, et cetera. And, and they're bilateral relationships, but the, um, the capacity to return to the emotional commitment to the kind of um, uh, passage that we undertook successfully in World War II is just not there. While on the other hand, the Chinese in contrast have a tremendous um, psycho-historical head of steam to see this as a kind of capstone experience. Uh, once we get over this one way or the other, I think uh, the relationship between the two great powers will settle into a kind of rough stability. So I'm saying that this is a really kind of a dangerous, uh, brittle window in, in terms of a possibility uh, of uh, un unexpected conflict. Interesting, thank you, yeah. Um, so I wanna, open up the ability for you know each of you to respond to the other as you, as you wish, just let me know. Um, one thing that I found really interesting about Michael's remarks just now was this idea of, of kind of the, the paradigm of American sort of liberal internationalism being um, deflated or having lost its verve in some way um, and lacking that that sort of narrative purpose or like we're clinging to the old one and like there is a definitely a kind of risk in in doing that um but you also described this kind of like ceremonial expansionism almost of in chinese foreign policy um and so it's the absence of war as something to almost worry about whereas bob pointed to the absence of you know killing people as you know, and evidence that like 
uh, an indication of sort of Chinese intentions for the time being. I just wonder if there's room for crosstalk about this or if there's a perspective to share. Well, if I could just add one thing about the points you made. Um, the Chinese are extremely well-versed in ceremonial uh, strategy. And in fact, most of their client relationships for the last, what, a thousand years and more ha have been uh, framed by the most elaborate and intense ceremony uh, equivalent to that of Byzantium at its height. And um, the Belt and Road Initiative itself is a, a kind of textbook example of, of orchestrating a grand strategy without um, actually having to fight in it. And it's been a, an interesting effort and, and, and I think quite successful in many ways. There is, of course, a Chinese interest in realizing historical missions and, and rituals matter and rituals of victory matter, but there's also the impact of, of defeat. Right. Protected war. And that puts an element of what Michael would call pragmatism in Chinese policy. So to think that they would be driven to war over Taiwan so they could have the image of victory and the historical accomplished and not take into account that when the balloon goes up, war can be right. very predictable. I think you have to think about that half too. The Chinese have yes. lived with the status quo of Taiwan being part of China politically, diplomatically since 1949. And so that seems to be some tolerance and patience on their part and pragmatism. Um, war a on an island that doesn't like you very much. Landing amphibian geography that looks like Tito's Yugoslavia and the partisans fighting Germany. That might be in of itself a deterrent because the cost of not having a quick victory would be far greater than deterring the rituals of success. I, I totally agree. And this is the major problem, the hurdle that the, uh, the, the plan and the, uh, the, you know, the PLA have to overcome. Uh, so when I was using those awkward uh, French taglines like force majeure, or coup de main, basically it would have to be an extremely uh, rapid uh, descent on, onto Taiwan and uh, to come at the long end of the trail in which um, Taiwan's people have, and government have been slowly losing heart, a kind of an erosion of their either will to fight or their belief that they can uh, hold the Chinese back. At this point, uh, from what I can come up with looking very carefully at D-Day, is that an assault on Taiwan right now would be a lot more difficult for China than D-Day was for Britain, France. I mean, Britain, the US, and Canada. Uh, in other words, um, it, they couldn't pull off um, the criteria that I've mentioned. And so they'll have to be at a point where not only they feel they have that, not only they feel the US has no capacity or desire uh, um, to intervene, and where they have uh, developed a, a, an interior storyline uh, in which um, everything they do from now to you know, D-Day or X-Day has served to uh, effectively erode uh, Taiwanese will and belief in their capacity to uh, remain uh, independent. Well, I, I mean, I would, I would agree with what both Michael and, and Bob have said to a point, uh, but uh, you know, Xi Jinping will not lose his job if he fails to reunite uh, Taiwan. Uh, if he tries and fails to do it, he will lose his job. So I think that's, that's a real deterrent. Uh, and yet he feels compelled to, you know, send 50 or 60 flights into the ages uh, to send a message to Taiwan, uh, but doesn't seem to understand that the message that he's sending uh, is not only to Taiwan, but to the rest of the world. So Taiwan is now finally taking uh, defense seriously. You know, one of the problems had always been the Taiwanese didn't believe that China would ever attack them. 
Uh, they're starting to believe that. Uh, so is the United States, so is Europe. And quite frankly, all of our quote unquote experts who talk about war games that show China can conquer Taiwan in two or three days, which to me is nonsense, uh, uh, just you know, adds to that and adds to the Chinese mind game against Taiwan. But my view is that uh, Xi Jinping has been tactically clever, but strategically foolish. You know, he, he, was, he was successful in tamping down criticism of China in Hong Kong, uh, but at what cost? Uh, you know, that he, there was no threat coming from, a, you know, an, an annual demonstration about Tiananmen in Hong Kong. Uh, but now that he's demonstrated that China is prepared to completely violate the basic agreement, the basic accord with the UK uh, on the terms of, of Hong Kong reversion, he's reminded the rest of the world that uh, China cannot be trusted. So there have been a lot of things that the Chinese have done that may make sense as far as instant gratification is concerned, uh, but certainly don't seem to have uh, a long-term view and don't have uh, uh, an awareness of long-term consequences where we always credit China with being the long-term while we're the instant gratification. Uh, but, it, but it seems to me that uh, Xi Jinping uh, falls into the Donald Trump category of you know, instant gratification and the hell with the long-term strategic thinking. All right, uh, can we have Mike Swain and then Bob? Sure, thanks. Well, I think you know, we've been talking a lot about Taiwan. I think we need to step back a bit and talk about uh, the topic of the panel, which is what, whether Asia, uh, I mean, the issue of whether or not China is going to invade Taiwan is an important issue. And it really is one that will be a bellwether for anything else that happens in the region if China were to do that. <clears throat> but I don't think the incentives for China to do that are terribly uh, high, much less unavoidable for, um, for Beijing at this point in time. Uh, so I think what we're looking at here is a, is a region where, where the United States and China are going to be engaged increasingly in areas of competition, uh, in a whole variety of different areas. And in the process of doing that, they will be vying for support from other countries in the region. And the problem with that is that none of the countries in the region want to uh, give support to either just the United States or China. They're all, as we know, very cross-cutting and very much uh, conflicted in their interests in how far they should go in supporting this or that U.S. position against the Chinese and vice versa. Uh, and that means that there's a much more complex, much more fluid kind of an environment in Asia that I think is going to characterize that environment unless, unless something happens like a Taiwan blow up that really does precipitate efforts by the United States and China to really take determined action and that will lead countries in the region to then have to really take a stand in some way or another. Many of them will try to stay out of it. Uh, and I think many in Southeast Asia will. Um, the Japanese will be very hard put to stay out of it, even though I think there are people in Japan that would like to stay out of it. Um, but that could very well end up redefining the whole nature of the region. But that's not where we are now. And I, I don't think we should be assuming that that's where we're necessarily headed. The whole point is to try to avert this kind of a conflict over Taiwan. That is the primary objective, and as I see it, of US policy in Asia should be, and not creating blocks to counter China. Um, it should be on how do we avoid getting into a real confrontation over Taiwan and then B, how do we reduce the incentives for intensive competition that would jeopardize our ability to work with each other on other issues that are, in my view, more important than the uh, grand tectonic strategic competition between the US and China, which people have described it as being. And by that, I mean climate and the challenge of climate change, which is a true existential threat, unlike China. And the pandemic, the future of pandemics, uh, WMD proliferation as indicated by what's happened on the Korean Peninsula and what that means, and the rise of populist movements in various quarters, particularly within the United States. And there's already been some allusion to that. Those are the primary concerns and threats the United States and China should be focused on. 
not you know whether one or the other of them is going to gain the advantage over Taiwan. I think both sides have strong incentives in trying to keep Taiwan on the back burner as much as possible. And here I would I would tend to disagree a little bit with Ralph because I think that characterizing the problems that we're facing in 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 dealing with China today are kind of like China's gone off the rails is not an accurate way of understanding where we are today. Because I think there's been a very interactive process here. The United States has taken certain actions and said certain things at certain times that have very much alarmed the Chinese, leading them to take certain actions that they might not otherwise have taken. And so I think you have to understand that there is an interactive dynamic going on here, that the real threat to security in Asia isn't China threatens the US, the real threat is there is a security dilemma in Asia that's become a deep security competition that could derail the interests of all the powers concerned if it gets out of control. It is the common threat of that security dilemma and the competition that is the real threat, to my mind, and both sides contribute to it. Well, the U.S. actually is the most worrisome in regards to the legacy narrative that we have been that has been bestowed on us from our ancestors. Um, I have written about this at length, but in the period after World War I, um, the US Navy was committed to fighting a war with Japan. And it got that war eventually, but it worked hard to get it. And it built up a, a, a bow wave, pardon the expression, of expectation that the destiny of America and the Navy was to fight Japan. And the army had the same vision of Germany after World War I. A lot of that was for planning purposes, but nonetheless, there's a lot of continuity there. And uh, I've you know, talked to a lot of people in the Navy and they're all fired up about going to war. And if you, you know, look every day, there are articles uh, blithely talking about how well would the Navy do in a war with China? And I think this is part of the process in which the narrative leads to the event. So it, to, to that extent, I, I agree with you that, that the, the US, uh, in, because of the structural nature of its narrative, is more inclined to take a course that will not just lead to conflict, but kind of embrace the idea of conflict. And you know, if you really wanna take it to its furthest extent, think about the, the phrase Cold War. Cold War is, oh, we can't have a war, damn, but we can call it a war and give it all of the ceremonial <laughs> trappings emotionally of a war, which is what we did for decades and uh, demonize the, the Soviets. And we're still demonizing the Soviets, even though they're not called Soviets. It, it is a worrisome thing in and of itself. And so what I see is a, a collision between the inward looking needs of, of Xi, which is to fulfill and complete this great passage of China to its destiny, uh, you know, mark the end of the century of humiliation. And yet the US has a, an aggressive narrative in which uh, uh, the nature the state of America domestically is tied to our mission to humanity. And this, this has created problems for us um, almost perpetually through our history. I, I want to turn to Ralph, but Bob's been waiting patiently. So first, Bob, please. Uh, you're muted again, man. First, I want to build on what Michael was saying about Taiwan. Um, this is an action-reaction process, but we tend to impute Chinese behavior as, if you will, impatient or coercive. And maybe it is designed to caution others. So I think it's significant that the Trump administration began their regular transits to the Taiwan Strait with the American Navy in July of 2018. And China didn't begin its, its entry into Taiwan's ADIZ until almost two years later. And during that time, there were also arms sales to Taiwan. The mainland has a long history of, of using this kind of behavior to warn the United States, careful where you go, we may end up in a place we don't want to be. 
This was 54, 55, this was 58, this was 1996. Uh, and the danger we face, we don't wanna go there is we don't know where the red lines are. We don't know where the mainland may say, this is getting out of hand, we don't wanna go any further. And then things tend to happen and we're not where we wanna be. Um, so whether it's US cabinet level visits to Taiwan, whether it's arms sales to Taiwan, whether it's transfer to Taiwan Strait, whether it's military presence on Taiwan, these all have the effect of making the mainland nervous of where this is going. And we can also impute an, a, a motivation to them, an intention to them to try and stabilize the situation rather than having go place no one wants to go. Now, Michael's other, Michael raised the point of where, and got us back to our topic, where do we think um, Asia is headed to? And that is an important question. Um, and Michael's right that the region is trying to stay out of the US-China conflict. And increasingly we're seeing countries, South Korea, Philippines, Singapore, Malaysia, and others, drifting toward a more equidistant place. One, we should acknowledge that this reflects a weakening of American security and a gain for China. America, if you will, is losing its influence in East Asia as China is successfully moving these countries further away from the United States and a little closer to China. And that's a zero sum game. And the United States is not gonna be able to reverse that, nor I think we're gonna be able to stabilize that. Whether it's South Korea, whether it's the Philippines under Royo and Duterte, whether it's um, Singapore, um, these countries are going to continue to adjust to the shifting naval balance. But we shouldn't think the United States is irrelevant. We shouldn't think that this is going to be Chinese hegemony, or that China's the next naval superpower taking over the world. We're witnessing the emergence of bipolarity in these days, in which this is not a Cold War bipolarity the way we had in Europe, where we're polarized into blocks, in a much more fluid environment where countries are going to train with other countries. They're going to have trade with both China and the United States. They're going to have diplomacy and cooperation with both. It's a much more fluid relationship which of course is good for both countries, but no one wants to see polarization again. <clears throat> the challenge for the United States is to try and gracefully adjust to decline, which is not easy. Mm -hmm. Been number one for such a long period of time, it's not easy to say, all right, we're gonna have two number ones. But that's the American challenge. And right now we've seen it from Trump, we've seen it from, from the Biden administration, mm -hmm. we're leading toward the confrontational this of the three C's because we want to resist that. At some point, we need to find a way for these two great powers to get along, compete, maybe some confrontation if necessary, but again, to quarantine those conflicts with high security interests to cooperate where we should and must, including climate change. Ralph, did you have a uh, two finger? Yeah, I, I wanted to go back to uh, Michael's point about interactive dynamics, uh, but uh, you know Bob touched on that as well. Uh, I think it's very true uh, that you know there are things the U.S. has done that have caused China to do things. There are things China has done that have caused us to do things. But you know Michael and Bob and others have been in these conversations. Uh, I certainly have been, uh, and particularly uh, in the era of Zoom, where we don't have a coffee break to uh, then talk about what people really think. Uh, we can sit down with the Chinese and together come up with a list of a dozen things that the U.S. could and should have done better to manage the relationship. Then when the topic turns to, well, what are the things China could have done better to manage the relationship? Uh, you get blank stares from the Chinese. Uh, well, you know, there's, it's all U.S. fault and therefore we can't imagine anything that we could done differently uh, because to say we could have done something better uh, would be to imply that Xi Jinping is less than perfect. Uh, and right now, I, my sense is the Chinese are running scared uh, in doing that. Uh, that makes it very hard to have a debate about how you can uh, manage interactive dynamics. Uh, I think Michael or Bob earlier had, had complained that one of the problems uh, with uh, the U.S. approach is that uh, when we say cooperation, it's uh, for our interests, not China's. Uh, I, I don't apologize for, you know, the U.S. pursuing U.S. interests. Uh, I think that's what we're supposed to do. Uh, the question is how you go about it. Uh, you will never hear me uh, 
praise or defend Mike Pompeo. Uh, but initially, the Trump administration got it right uh, when under Mattis and, and McMaster and others, uh, the focus was on reciprocity. Uh, if China wants us to uh, do things in a certain way or we want them, you know, we, we need to have a level playing field. Uh, Pompeo turned it uh, into uh, an anti-CCP. Uh, and I think that, that undermined our own interests. Uh, if you attack Chinese behavior, uh, I think you, you might possibly get the Chinese to change their behavior. Uh, when you attack their system, uh, the basis of their legitimacy, uh, obviously that's not going to occur. So to me, one of the real challenges right now for the U.S., uh, while we talk about promoting democracy, that's in our DNA, and we're going to have a gathering of democracies for, for some reason, if we can all de decide to def on a common definition of what constitutes a democracy, we really need to be focusing on Chinese behavior and not on ideology, not on a democracy, because that, in fact, will generate a new Cold War that will serve no one's interests. Thanks. Uh, response. From who? Amen. Mike, uh, Swain, yeah, sorry, Michael. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I really don't disagree with, with, with uh, most of what Ralph just said. I, I would just say that, sure, the Chinese themselves are not going to rhetorically and openly say, uh, Boy, we made we made these these specific mistakes that have let, landed us where we are today. Yes, they have a, a line about the United States going off the rails, and they're trying to oppose and present themselves as being the sort of stable, rational adult in the room. And they they're still doing that um, because they think it plays well not in the United States but in other other countries as it looks at the United States, particularly under Trump as being kind of a, you know, berserk country that has just kind of lost its senses. And I, I think though that that doesn't necessarily mean that the Chinese in actual negotiations and discussions are not gonna act on their interests and recognize where there are certain problems in what they're doing. And that that creates problems for the United States and from the, for themselves. In other words, they can be moved certainly by both argument and by um, enticement or even pressure to do certain things or to even redefine their own interests. Um, that has happened in many occasions over the past in US-China relations. But I think it does require a certain amount of honesty about their willingness to be involved in a kind of give and take engagement with the Chinese. Uh, and it requires that on the part of the United States as well. Uh, I think Bob mentioned the United States really is still in the process today of adjusting to a very different environment uh, worldwide in terms of power distribution and levers of influence and in Asia in particular. And it still hasn't really, I think, found its feet. It hasn't really uh, established a stable foundation for what it wants to see and what role it wants to play within Asia. It has a lot of catchwords, you know, Democracy versus authoritarianism, great power competition. We're going to deal with China from a position of strength. We're going to call China to account, um, but we don't want to have a war. I mean, there's just all of these kind of, you know, propaganda messages that are not really leading to much more specific definitions about what the United States wants, what kind of policy changes um, it would like to see come about, and what it needs to do itself to reach those kinds of objectives. Um, none of this is being spelled out in any clear way, in my view, by the Biden administration. They say they're doing a China policy review, but I've seen no real evidence of it. Um, you still get these kind of episodic statements and now the Xi, Xi Jinping Biden interaction, which was kind of a, an exchange of ritual mantras, but with some additional benefits, at least they were talking, at least they agreed to have more meetings and they set up certain working groups, which should, I hope, have an effect over time. But you know, we've got to get past this kind of image of it is zero sum. You know, the region is polarizing. They're either with us or they're against us. Um, it's, the region's just not going to go in that direction unless there is a real confrontation with China and the United States.
And the United States and China have to both adjust to that fact and adjust to the limitations of their own power and resources and influence in dominating uh, the region or any other particular um, area. Part of the problem we're facing is, is that we uh, cannot bring ourselves as uh, Washington um, uh, courtiers to, um, to examine the uh, uh, tremendous uh, role uh, of instability within the US. And the divided nation is uh, going to um, encourage uh, a very uh, exuberant analysis on the part of our adversaries as to how they can take advantage of what is increasingly uh, an immobilization uh, of America. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we still have a, um, a sort of uh, an imperial uh, class that can devote itself to uh, tending to the world is of, of little value when the country itself is not there uh, engaged uh, internationally, and where the uh, conflict within the U.S. is uh, increasing. And uh, many uh, commentators are already identifying the 2024 election as a moment of crisis. And I would like to see more analysis being done of the, the role that an immobilized polity has in encouraging um, strategic decision-making by by that country's adversaries. Uh, a, a good example would be how uh, uh, the UK took advantage of um, the weakness of the United States during the Civil War. And uh, Britain took huge advantage of the opportunity. And so uh, although there was uh, probably no realistic uh, prop, uh, chance that the British would intervene militarily, they did send over a million Enfield uh, rifles to the Confederacy, and that kept them fighting. Uh, they also uh, destroyed, through the proxy of uh, Confederate ships that were built in Britain and manned by British, they destroyed the largest merchant marine in the world. And uh, they also um, protected Confederate blockade runners, uh, which created a kind of lifeline for the Confederacy. They did all of these things without going to war, although they put much, in fact, most of their ironclads, the, the super ships they have, the carriers of the day into Bermuda where they stayed the whole war. Now, th th this is the behavior of, of a country that's since become our bosom ally, our special relationship. Now, imagine what other countries could do in a situation where the, the nation is completely out. And I, I, I haven't seen any analysis of that. And I think we really need to to get a, a handle on how that all gets adjudicated so that we can understand perhaps what the uh, behavior of, of China and Russia to an extent will be. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I'm not supposed to have an opinion because I'm a moderator, but I think it's effing crazy that we operate a China policy that pretends like we're not on the brink of a civil war, that we don't have a massive legit, like, what are, what are we doing, you know? Um, so let's Mike, put that to the side. Bob Bob, and uh, then Michael Swain, just- uh, I had a two-fingered, I don't know if Bob's is, a, uh, Bob, are you on this point or are you-, are you... Yeah, I'm on this point, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm one, I just want to agree with, with, um, with Ralph about the frustration of dealing with our Chinese counterparts. Um, we're not going to have a dialogue where we're going to think that we need some mutual force correction. Um, the United States is doing X, Y, and Z wrong. And even those cases where the Chinese clearly acknowledge by their shoulder movements that yes, they made mistakes, that's all they can do is acknowledge with their shoulders or with their shrugs. So that is frustrating, but we shouldn't allow that to at the same time blind us to the ability of China to be pragmatic. And even the small steps we are now taking of mutual and reciprocal efforts to improve the relationship so I'd call your attention to two days before this virtual summit, the Chinese leadership announced that the Boeing Dreamliner was now safe for to be considered by Chinese regulators. This was not insignificant, a major American corporation that is basically dying because it doesn't have the Chinese market. And that was a concession. The, day, the next day, the United States released 
the Chinese businesswoman who was found on uh, Mar-a-Lago and returned her to China. And then after this summit, we had an agreement to talk about nuclear weapons and nuclear stability, which the Chinese have been reluctant to do. And we also had an agreement to allow uh, multi-year, multi-entry visas for journalists. Um, these are all reciprocal. These are at the margins of what we might call high politics, but both sides are able to do things to reciprocate the other, to signal their intentions to move the relationship forward. And again, the summit, as others have said, sends a clear signal to the entire bureaucracy on both sides that it is okay to explore cooperation with your Chinese counterpart. It was just the opposite signal that came out of Alaska. The hostility expressed made it impossible for diplomats and policymakers and bureaucrats to reach out to their counterparts on the other side, lest they get out too far ahead of their secretary of state or their foreign minister and hostility toward the other. So this, this, the summit may be at the margin, but we do need to see the small steps both sides are taking, both sides are able to take to move the relationship forward. Michael Swain. Yeah, I just wanted to have a, a comment on what Michael said about the U.S. domestic situation and the the you know instability and and, and what you said as well, Van. I'm you know I, I think you can read this different ways uh, from the Chinese perspective. Um, the the common and sort of pat assumption is that oh good the U.S. is in decline uh, our opportunity has arrived. Um, I don't think that's we should be cautious about that because I, I did a. I did a close look at Chinese views on U.S. declinism for a, a article I wrote recently. Now it's it's not classified; it's not based on unpublished sources or anything. But there's a lot of variation among Chinese thinking about about what a declining America represents for the United States. For for many Chinese, it represents unpredictability, which they don't like, and it also represents desperation that could occur that would actually be played out against China. And in fact, I think that you know there are elements of that, although I wouldn't call it desperation, there are elements that China is being used in a very polarized political environment to, to reach unity uh, across the aisle. And so uh, maximizing a hostile attitude towards China serves political interests in a very fractious and contentious domestic political environment. And that's not good for China. Uh, so I think you can, you can make the argument that their ideal would be if the United States did not have as much capacity to oppose the, to oppose China and that it would continue to decline, but not decline too far and not decline too fast. <laughs> and they, they want to try to modulate that as best they can. And that doesn't really result in a calculation that, oh, my God, it's full, you know, full course press, full court press, wolf warrior diplomacy. You know, let's unveil because the U.S. is on the way. Down. No. I think they're much more pragmatic than that. And I think they're much more cautious and they're fearful about, well, about what, what a U.S. would possibly do. That's why I brought up uh, Britain in the American Civil War. The British were extremely careful and they had many of the same uh, attitudes about intervening in the Civil War. And they were worried uh, what to do. Uh, the last thing they wanted was to see Canada invaded. Uh, and taken over, and that was what what would have happened. And so they handled it with great uh, flair and delicacy. But mm -hmm. at the same time, they did everything they could to um, to weaken the U.S. So I, I I agree. I mean, the Chinese are not um, they're not out for blood. They're not uh, looking for an aggressive uh, moment of advantage strategically through some sort of dangerous gambit. Right. But I think that this is this is an opportunity and they see it as such. They also, as you said, worry the two things are going on at the same time. OK, we've we've kind of reached the point where I should turn to the audience questions. And uh, the first one is for everybody. It's a free for all. Um, it says, wait, sorry, I lost it. Hold on. Uh, do panelists think that it is a deliberate and strategic policy choice by China to challenge U.S. hegemony or simply an inevitable and unavoidable result of China's rising power? 
is, is, is competition over hegemony happening incidentally or deliberately, right? Well, let me take the a answer point. is yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, yeah. So let me first be a nerd, an academic nerd, and say that we understand the security dilemma to mean two status quo powers whose efforts to maintain their security elicits unintended outcomes. China is not a status quo power. It is a revisionist power that doesn't like the status quo that existed in China from 19, existed on China's periphery from 1949 to the present. And it wants to use its greater economic and naval power to weaken the American presence on China's coastal borders. That's what's going on here. That's a conscious effort to do that. And is it the outcome of China's rise? You bet it is. They have more capabilities to achieve their security, and they're going to use those abilities, use those capabilities to achieve that security. So the question, the follow-up to that is, well, how do they go about it? What are their tactics? What are their policies? What are they? What are their strategies? Are they reckless? Are they incautious? Are they high risk takers? So far, we haven't seen that. And so there, that's sort of the question we need to ask: is how impatient are they? And this, for the most part, has been a fairly bide your time for a long time, but also to believe that time is on their side, the balance continues to shift, and countries will, the gravitational pull of China will continue to pull countries closer to them. So there's no need to be either impatient or high risk or destabilizing. Others? Well, I, th I think that, I mean, I, I generally agree with that, although I, I don't think that it means necessarily that, that we should assume that the Chinese um, are out to dominate the region as a vital national necessity. Now, people have big debates about this. Um, what, are, what are China's ultimate objectives in, in Asia? Um, are they seeking to throw the US out? Are they seeking to dominate the region? Um, you know, Taiwan is really just a stepping stone to doing that. Uh, and people have made these arguments and are doing so increasingly in Washington. But I, I think they really do sort of tend to sidestep the obvious, which is that the Chinese are, are not, um, they're not people, I don't think they're a, a nation that defines their, their interests in terms of acquiring uh, new territory, or that they don't think, I mean, beyond what they think is theirs, which is very limited, um, or in terms of exerting a kind of military dominance over, uh, over the Asia region. I think they do want to have much more influence. They're also very attentive to what the costs would be of trying to achieve a level of dominance that we might regard as being true dominance. And therefore, they see those costs as being prohibitive, at least under existing conditions, to them acting more aggressively to try and achieve that end. So what are they, so are they willing to accept something less? And so my, my argument would be that yes, they are. If you can establish the right set of incentives and you may remain engaged yourself, but you recognize that you're not gonna dominate the region either, you being the US, uh, and that you need to reach some kind of middle ground on this, um, I think it's possible to reach some kind of middle ground that could be reasonably stable for a period of time if you can stabilize the Taiwan issue. If you can stabilize the Taiwan issue, I think you can establish a degree of stability. And, and I would say that even if, even if you were to assume that the Chinese you know, would like to be the dominant power in Asia, um, the question is, what is the reality? What is the likelihood of their being able to do it? And what are the alternatives? I, I agree. That's why I brought up Taiwan, because uh, yeah. if Taiwan is resolved, uh, things can subside down to a kind of, uh, you know, stable interaction of the Chinese. Mostly, it seems to me, want to want to get the U.S. to stop being the strategic aggressor. And they see the U.S. as an aggressive force. They have to, you know, going back to um, you know, U.S. Marines in Beijing in 1900 and everything that happened after that, that's made an indelible mark on China. I mean, there, there was a U.S. Marine Brigade and a U.S. Army Brigade 
and 12 gunboats going up Chinese rivers all through the 20s and 30s. In fact, our, our, at our legation, the Marine Guard was 700 men. I mean, this is uh, astonishing. And you think about the U.S. being isolationist. Well, in the Chinese mind, it's, it's decades and decades, a century and more of U.S. Not, not so much the evil aggression like the Europeans or certainly the Japanese, but, but they'd, they'd like to see the U.S. just sort of stand down. And I think um, that, would, that would content them. Now, I, I don't necessarily disagree with what uh, my three colleagues had just finished saying, but, uh, you know, if you want to be a, a world power, uh, the first thing you have to develop is a thick skin. Uh, and it's very clear that Xi Jinping has not developed this thick skin. Uh, take a look at uh, Chinese treatment of Australia right now. Uh, as, as best as I can tell, the Aussies sin. Uh, was to echo what everyone else in the world has been saying about the need for a full accounting of how COVID started. Uh, and uh, China has essentially started a trade war with, with uh, Australia, uh, violated uh, their own US, uh, Australia, China trade agreements uh, because of this. Uh, we've seen this over and over and over again. Uh, you know, the slightest affront uh, to Xi or to the Communist Party results in a severe overreaction. So these actions have consequences, and and I you know if if China can't accept that, uh, then it you know they have to. Well, why are the Aussies you know getting nuclear submarines, or why are, is something else happening? And it's oh, it must be because of some U.S. conspiracy. Uh, not as a reaction uh, to what China is is doing, uh, and. Uh, I think this is this is a problem that we seem to be downplaying a little bit too much. Right. Um, well, if I could question. just add one thing. Oh, yeah, sorry. yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I, I, I think the best approach for the U.S. is to send a signal to China and develop relationships that are not in the old mode of U.S. messianism, which was uh, they're all our clients, essentially. You know, the, the standards of the U.S.-NATO relationship in the Cold War. Instead, if the U.S. can guarantee and support Australia, uh, Japan, Korea, all of the people that we call friends and really say, we won't let China uh, reduce you to that uh, client status that they, they seek. And I, I do believe the Chinese seek to frame client relations in the old uh, Qing manner with uh, all of the surrounding states. And so our, in some ways, our best strategy may be to, to give heart to all of those countries, know that we'll be there for them and that we will, we will make sure the Chinese don't do what they're clearly trying to do with Australia. And that is to impose that relationship. When, when the Chinese had all these students in Australia informing on other Chinese students, that was, that was horrifying. It was a complete window aperture into um, the, the larger Chinese approach. But it's not, it's not aggressive in, in the you know, uh, dominant sense of um, imperialism. It's more like these client relationships, the old style dynastic approach, like the Chinese had for 700 years with Korea. Yeah, I do panels like this way too much like all the time and i don't know that i've ever been on one that had this kind of tone and tenor and like small r kind of realism like there's a soberness to this discussion that uh, i'm enjoying quite a bit for uh the next question this is again for everybody this kind of jumps forward into an alternative future would Chinese hegemony in the Asia Pacific imperil U.S. trade and business activity in the region such that U.S. Uh, prosperity would significantly suffer? Short answer, short answer is we don't know, but the uncertainty of it is enough to motivate a desire to prevent it. Um, the, fundamental, the fundamental basis for... U.S. policy in, in Asia has been for a long time to uh, have a situation where a hostile dominant power cannot emerge 
in the region that is hostile to the United States. And, you know, a lot of mileage has been has been uh, taken out, out of, you know, involved in that in that statement that that really can spin out in all directions about, I mean, you can weave all kinds of theories about what the Chinese would likely do um, if they were to quote unquote dominate the region. You first have to define what that means in a very concrete terms, um, how China would on that basis be able to, uh, let's say, expel the US from the region, <clears throat> which would be a hugely difficult thing to do. And then how it would go about uh, uh, keeping, keeping the United States out of the region short of war. So, you know, to me, this is kind of like a, an argument that people use to try and justify the heavy sort of military footprint that the United States has uh, in the Western Pacific and the past, what the United States calls balance of power, which really wasn't a balance of power at all. In the maritime realm, it was American dominance. And, you know, if, if, you, if you bring in that, that, that fear of Chinese hegemony, uh, excluding the United States, then you know you can justify almost anything. But again, you get back to the question of how do you do it? What does it look like? What are the alternatives? And what is the risk calculus that the Chinese would have? And there, I think those are all malleable. Van, I'm, I apologize. I'm going to have to leave soon. Um, I have to teach. Um, but this is a very important question and a question Americans don't address. We want to compete with China in the East China Sea. We want to compete with China in the South China Sea. We cannot allow Chinese dominance in maritime East Asia and East Asian waters. Well, what would happen if they did? How important is the South China Sea? How important is the East China Sea? We think about trade. Well, I can't find a peacetime example of a great power denying trade routes and shipping lanes to another great power. Moreover, 70% of the trade going in the South China Sea is to China. So if they trade, they'd be blocking their own economy. So I think the trade issue and the sea lane issue for trade is highly inflated over the implications of the rise of China inside the South China Sea. But equally important is the, this issue of we must keep Asia divided. We can't allow, allow a dominant naval power inside East Asia for then it could threaten American interests in the Western Pacific. Well, is that true? Um, is a strategic relationship with Australia, India, and Japan sufficient with naval power in the Western Pacific sufficient to protect American coastal water, to protect shipping lanes across the Pacific? Um, what would be the cost of trying to compete? And the cost would be high. The way the cost would be now would be printing money for a higher defense budget or cutting social welfare benefits or <laughs> taking money away from the, uh, from, the, from the army and put it into the Navy. None of these things we're willing to do, but that's what would be required if you really want to compete. And are those costs worth it? How valuable is the South China Sea to American security? As a nation, we just assume we cannot allow China to challenge America. And, but those questions are never addressed. And those are the core questions. And worth the candle. And let me say thank you very much to Van and to everyone here. This was a very good conversation. I think we did address very critical issues. And now I have to take everything I learned in this discussion and give it to my students for the next hour and a half. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. So we're, we're just about out of time. But on this question, I wanted to see if, uh, if Ralph or Michael had a, anything to add before we wrapped up. Well, I... I strangely enough uh, find myself in agreement with Michael Swain. So I'm going to have to reassess, I guess, everything I believe. In. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, I mean, I, I don't believe that, that China can attain the degree of hegemony uh, over East Asia uh, that would threaten, totally threaten U.S. interests, because uh, the more China pushes its weight around in East Asia, the more the rest of East Asia begs us to stay and finds ways of keeping us there as, as the counterbalance. Uh, so I, I don't lose a lot of sleep over that. Uh, I don't think, uh, as Bob Ross seems to think, that Chinese hegemony would be a good thing uh, or that uh, it would be uh, you know, docile toward the United States. Uh, but I, I think we, you know, we need to understand uh, how unattractive uh, Chinese behavior has been 
and essentially there wouldn't be a quad uh, if it hadn't been for what China was doing along the Indian border and what they've been doing toward Australia and, and you know, Japanese somewhat justifiable paranoia toward China. Uh, so, uh, you know, there, China's been its own worst enemy and the U.S. needs to be clever in capitalizing upon that uh, at the same time as trying to find uh, ways we can cooperate where our, where our interests coincide. Uh, and uh, up until a couple of days ago, the official Chinese position was we can't cooperate with you anywhere as long, you know, unless you change your behavior and here are 16 things you, you need to do. Uh, that was a complete non-starter. Uh, that's been changed now. So I'm, uh, how do we say it, cautiously optimistic uh, that we'll be able to better manage the competition uh, after this summit and uh, that maybe we'll have some better discussions with our Chinese colleagues on, on how to do it. Thanks. You know, um, hegemon is a, a classically archaic term that perfectly fits the uh, international relations within the, uh, the Greek city-state community of the fifth century BC, in which Greek city-states would fight, not just at the drop of a hat, but they, they were thirsty to fight. And it was all over status, relative status, uh, and the, the top city-state with the status was the hegemon. Um, we're not in a war thirsty situation today. We're not in the 1914 situation. We're in a situation where the battles for status uh, are fought, again, as, as I like to encourage all of us to think, in, in ceremonial ways. So this, certainly what has just happened with Australia is a, a perfect example of trying to bring a client gently to heal through this kind of ceremony of abasement and, uh, you know, um, and threats, coercion. And this is how the Chinese would operate absent the U.S. And I think it's certainly within American uh, capabilities to, to head off this outcome and to counterbalance China that way. Moreover, the more that China is successful in creating uh, a client kingdom's uh, around it, the the more that Russia will be poised to be our our new BFF in Eurasia, and I think that's that's something that the Chinese must be thinking about. Likewise, as we've seen with India recently, um, that hasn't worked out so well for China either. So India and Russia together would would be a, a, a dynamite package along with uh, Australia, Korea, and Japan to put China in a situation where this effort wasn't paying off. So I think there are inherent built-in disincentives to, to Chinese strategic bad behavior, the worst behavior, not, not the kind of ritual humiliation. If I could just say, I mean, I, you know, I don't disagree with any of this. I just think that uh, we're, we're probably mistaken if we try to present this Chinese behavior as in any way kind of unique. Um, oh, yeah. The United, the United States, China is a highly nationalistic, to some extent, excessively arrogant, uh, resentful, uh, with a, a, high sto a high level of sensitivity. Guess what? So is the U.S. Uh, China has used economic leverage uh, against its political, uh, other political powers. Guess what? The U.S. does it all the time. Um, you know, we, we have to be able to come to grips with the fact that the Chinese are not sort of sui generis kind of power out there, you know, take over the world. They are reacting and acting to what they see as percepts, uh, threats on their on the horizon, and they're trying to make good on what they see as their increasing capabilities. This is gonna bump up against American interests. There's no question about it. And there are certain aspects of behavior that need to be modulated and moderated by the Chinese and by the Americans. And there has to be a belief that you can reach some kind of a middle ground, but that's not the that's not the way this is being framed in Washington. It's not really being framed like that. It's being framed as the Chinese have have arisen. They've challenged you know everything we hold dear, not just American power, but everything that underlays it, values, everything else. We've got to get them to behave themselves and really restrain themselves in what they do. And I just think that's a losing proposition if you approach it like that. You've got to recognize the Chinese look at the United States and they see hypocrisy in many, many different areas. We preach to them about the command of law of the sea and we don't ratify the law of the sea. 
convention. Uh, we tell them we want human rights to be recognized, and then we go off and do things uh, like you know kill civilians in Syria with drones and other things that you know many Americans just simply ignore. Uh, so there is a whole lot of issues here that would have to be really, uh, I think, be, be either controlled or resolved or in some way engaged so that the two sides can really deal with each other on a more realistic basis. Uh, and, and that's not to in any way excuse the Chinese and their behavior, because I agree with Ralph, the Chinese have been very stupid <laughs> in a lot of ways. But at the same time, you know, they're not unique. All right. That's going to do it. We've busted the clock. Uh, I appreciate this. And I, I hope everybody got as much out of this conversation as I did. Uh, I have to put in a quick plug for the next discussion, which is scheduled for 3.15 p.m. Eastern time. And it's titled A Deliberate Pacific Power Triangulating Canada and Its Strategy. Tune in. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, man.